First Chronicles 12, 32, of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200, and their brethren were at their command. Amen. This time, Brother Rick Major is going to bring our sermon for us. So good morning. I was telling uh, Sister Glenda, I guess I'm like the, the prodigal son who came home. And uh, I love being here. I love uh, just the fellowship here, to see all my friends. Uh, and I always say friends and relatives, Stombacks and Kimberly. You're, you're a better person than me. I, I, I would not have tried to, to lead the song service. I'd sound more like a wounded coyote when I sing. So uh, I just, uh, I'll leave that alone. And I see some new faces, that young man in the back, and, and uh, brother, it's, it's good to see you. I, I see a familiar face back there also. And Kevin, thank you for the, the Sabbath school lesson. When I, in fact, when I walked in today, and, and I met the family in the back, when I walked in today and, and I heard the comment about God and how much he loves us, and he loves us even more than himself. And when you read in Hebrews 6 and, of course, John 3, 16, I mean, who could, who could actually think of, I mean, think about it. Would you really give your only son or your only daughter, Kimberly, you, you, you have a little daughter and all of a sudden someone says, you've got to give her so that others may live. And that is the question that, that has always perplexed uh, mankind and many of us. How could God, how could Jesus give up being the king of the universe to come down here and die for people who didn't even love him, didn't even appreciate him. Uh, one other thing I heard during Sabbath school, Brother Kevin, uh, the, I've, been, I've been praying for a Porsche for many, many years. <laughs> and the Lord decided I didn't need it because I would be like Nebuchadnezzar. I'd say, is, is not this the great Babylon that I have built? Or, you know, I, I, so in other words, he, he has decided to keep me out of that realm, the possibility of of tempting me to, to drive by and just kind of wave and look like I, I did this. And so, in any case, remember, hello, hello. Remember, he has given all. Yes. For this portion of himself. Amen, 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 amen. I love that. <laughs> I love it. And I think that, you know, when we, when we read in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel uh, 28, when you think about that, just to digress, and then I'm going to get into the sermon, but uh, Kevin's like, see, I, I told you. But um, the Lord does things to keep us humble, and I think he, when, he, when he put all of that, all of that uh, I'll say the, the accessories on Satan, and he gave him, he made him the most beautiful creature, and he, he said that his heart was lifted up because of what? His beauty. And so the more things that we can do to beautify ourselves and accessorize ourselves, for some reason, it all, I won't say always, but many times it turns out that we start thinking we're beautiful instead of, and I, in fact, I heard a, a, a minister recently, and he brought up a good point. He said when, when Adam and Eve, they were, they were given a robe of what? Of light, of light, representing Christ's righteousness. And then when they sinned, what did they do? They, they hid, and when they hid, Christ, in fact, Christ came walking in the garden because Jesus Christ is the word of the Lord, so I, and Jesus Christ knelt down and created them, so Jesus Christ came into the garden, and he says, why, who told you you were naked? And they were like, wow, we didn't realize that that robe of light was from you. We thought that was us. So the point being, uh, we have, a, and I, I was going to take a picture. We have a big fig tree in our backyard that my wife planted. And I tell you, I didn't know why Christ was so upset when he went to the fig tree and 
he went and it had the leaves and it, and, and I mean, you can tell when, when those figs are coming because those leaves are, they're big and they're, I mean, everything else can be dry and yet that fig tree looks great. I mean, it's sucking in all that. And so they took, the, took fig leaves and created, the Bible says, aprons for themselves. And when you think about that, why did they use fig leaves? And th so this is what the, the minister was saying. He said, because the fig leaves have, um, I don't know if it's phosphorus or magnesium, there's some mineral in them. And they were trying to replicate or replace that holy light that God had given them, Jesus Christ, that robe of righteousness. So once again, they were trying to accessorize themselves. Long story short, I don't need a Porsche. So... <laughs> The Lord knows what he's doing. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being here today, Lord. Thank you for being with this group of believers. Bless us to have a wonderful time fellowshipping in you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Let everyone say amen, amen. So I came, I came here to just ask a question today. What time is it? And back in my day, there was, there, were a, there was a popular song, and they would start out by saying, what time is it? And you knew that the song was coming on. And I thought about that today with respect to the title for today's sermon, what time is it? I could literally just take the microphone like you did during Sabbath school service, Brother Kevin, and just ask people to you, what time is it, Sister Glenda? What time is it to you, Sister Brother Dave? What, you know, and just go around the room, what time is it? And pretty sure that most people would say, as the clock shows there, it's, it's the time of the end. Time is almost up. Jesus Christ promised us that he would return in John 14, 3. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be what? Also, Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, is coming back very soon. In fact, what we're going to talk about today is three things that we can do, that we must do, in order to be prepared. So what time is it? It's time to first, we need to understand the times. As Sister Kimberly read, we're going to read the, 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 uh, the, the text again, but it's time to understand the times in which we live. If we don't understand the times in which we live, then we can't be prepared so to know what to do, the second point is to know what to do. If you know what the times are, then you know what to do. Think of it in these terms. Uh, at 1 o'clock this morning, I mean, I'm, I'm looking, you all look so wonderful, but I, can, I guarantee you very few of you were dressed like you are right now at 1 o'clock this morning, 1 a.m., Perhaps a couple, I don't know. You're, you were so excited about coming to church today, you're like, I want to be ready several hours ahead of time. But generally speaking, and then when you wake up, we call it breakfast. And then we have lunch, we have dinner, we have, uh, I, for, for many years, uh, I worked and I had, to, I had to go in and I had to punch a clock. And even if you don't have to pl punch a clock, you still need to put your time in or you don't get paid. So there are a variety of things that we do that are related to time. Why are you here today? Time. Brother Dave recognized, he said, let's see, yesterday was Friday. He's a little more lucid than this, but I'm just, as an example. Yesterday was Friday. Today is the seventh day. It's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. I'm going to go to church today because it represents the day that he plans to come and worship with us at a designated time, his day. So knowing the time and then knowing what to do. We know what to do because God said, those who worship me worship in spirit and in truth. And Jesus Christ said in, in Mark 2, 27, 28, Sabbath was made for man and not man for Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And so we know what time it was to Jesus Christ. And so... Knowing what to do once you know what the time is. And then finally, the final point is, if you understand the times and you know what to do, then it's time to get, and I love the ser service already because we've heard about the Holy Spirit. Listening to the, po the power of the Holy Spirit, is the, the, the Holy Spirit 
even Satan trembles. And Jesus Christ was moved and inspired and anointed with whom? The Holy Spirit. So we have that same anointing. John the Baptist was anointed in the womb when he heard Mary's voice. It said he just he moved because of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, that's the thing, Luke eleven thirteen. God would rather give us his Holy Spirit than a parent would like to give their child a good gift. Why? Because he knows that if we're filled with the Spirit, I don't have to wonder. In, in fact, going back to the Porsche, the Holy Spirit will tell me when I should even ask God for a, a, a Porsche. He knows whether or not I can handle a Porsche. He knows that maybe I'm driving 100 miles back and forth to work each day through rocky terrain, and maybe a Jeep or a four-wheel drive or something like that would work better for me. And then the question comes to me, so I can get you something that will get you to work on time, and through the terrain you need to go through, why would you want something that just drew attention to you? And so that would be the question that we need to ask, walking in the Spirit. I remember back in the 1960s when we talked about, and, and Brother Kevin, since you asked the question, I'm a little bit older. I, I think I'm a couple years older than Dave, but I remember the 1960s. I remember what Adventism was like in the young men in the 1960s. And we weren't concerned about who was the president, Republican or Democrat. We weren't con libertarian, independent, didn't matter who. I, Melvin Laird was, the, I think, the Secretary of the State and, and different. I, I used to keep up with that, and my dad used to, I would be watching the news, and my dad would come in from work, and he'd say, Ricky, he said, look, those folks need, excuse me, those folks need Jesus too. And I was like, you know what, you're right. He said, so our job is to take the message to as many people as we can the problem is we're waiting to take the message to the president or to the, 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 the senators and congressmen, and we feel that we have a, a I used to watch a, a program called the Beverly Hillbillies. Anybody heard of that? Yes, yes, a few of you have. It was a poor family, and, and unfortunately the song is still in my mind, but I won't sing it for you. But in any case, they moved all the way to... Beverly Hills in an old beat up truck and they had discovered oil on their property and so they made millions of dollars and they moved to Beverly Hills and I remember even though with all of that money Granny Clampett used to be out in her it, I guess it had a nice patio she had a big kettle and she put a fire under it and she would start boiling her clothes she was washing clothes like this and she had millions of dollars so she's washing the clothes and she's stirring them. And she started singing a song and it was called Brighten the Corner Where You Are. And the song goes, do not wait until some deed of greatness you may do. Do not wait to shed your light afar to the many duties ever near you. Now be true, brighten the corner where you are. Don't worry about going to Capitol Hill. Don't worry about going to Raleigh. Don't worry about going to uh, influence some fantasy or, or some mogul, a media mogul or someone. We talked about it earlier. Am I going to my neighbors? Am I going to my friends? Brother, Brother Jeff talked about the, the challenge to his coworker. Are we doing that? It's easy for me to say, oh, if I had a, if I had a chance and I could go to, to Washington, and talk to some of the congressmen and senators. I would tell them about the Sabbath. I would tell them about the goodness of Jesus. I would tell them about his greatness. But my neighbor sees me go by every day and I wave. <laughs> what about that? What about taking that opportunity? Real quick, I, I preached a sermon, and I shared this with probably some of you, but it bears repeat, repeating. I preached a sermon in Raleigh on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the, I'm telling you, if, if you, when you prepare for a sermon, and just like preparing for a Sabbath school lesson, when you prepare, by the time you finish preparing, you're like pretty much a subject matter expert on that topic for a few days, right? I 
I was so convinced. I was so filled with the Spirit. And by the way, the Bible says God is what? Love. So when we say we love one another, when you say you love me and I say I love you, and we say that God is love, and in order to receive that love from God in our hearts, when you read John 14, 23 and John 14, 15 and, and those, you, when a person tells me they love me, I make the assumption that you're filled with the Holy Spirit because the only way you can love someone, even your wife or your husband, is that you have the Holy Spirit. That's how you got the power to do that, through the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. And we talked about a, the mustard seed this morning in, in, John, in uh, Romans 12. It says, 12, 3, it says, all of us were we were born, when we were born, Jesus Christ came over and he gave us a measure, it says, of faith. Now in the Bible, you could make, you could make at least a pancake-sized meal with a measure of wheat or a measure of flour. So the, if he says that I could take a mustard seed and say to the mountain, be thou cast into the midst of the sea, and it would rip itself out of the, out of the ground and toss itself into the sea, and I was given at birth like a pacifier or a toy, a measure of faith, brothers and sisters, we should be walking around, I, I, I use the term, the spiritual Tyrannosaurus Rex. We should be walking around. All right, so I preached the sermon, and I was so convinced by my own sermon. Remember that the prophets, they received inspiration from the Lord. It wasn't their inspiration. Even Ellen White, she received inspiration from the Lord but it was, it was for her just like it was for us. M.L. Andreessen said he went to her house and she, she, he asked her about something. He said uh, in, uh, in Desire of Ages, it, there's a, a quotation that says, in Christ is life original, unborrowed, and underived. He said, what, what do you mean? What, 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 can you explain that to me? And she's like, I have to study it just like you do. So the Lord inspires us through the power of the Holy Spirit. I left church, walked down off the, off the platform, walked out to my car. I drove, as I was driving home, I was impressed by the Holy Spirit to stop. And I said, I'm going to put this to the test. Can I actually have the power of the Holy Spirit and share that with someone else? So I stopped. I just pulled into a neighborhood, just pulled into a, a random neighborhood that the Holy Spirit impressed me to turn into. I turned into the neighborhood, and it was a cul-de-sac, so there were like eight to ten houses there. Now, this was in, this was in January of 2020, 2021, I believe it was. So in any case, when you come to my house around that time, January 2020, January 2021, any of those, day, those dates and times, I wasn't even answering the door because we were thinking that something might be transmitted. So I said, well, I'll just, I'll try. I said, but I want to share with these folks the good news that the Holy Spirit is real. Went to the first door, rang the doorbell, and I stood there. I didn't, okay, he might not. I stood there expecting someone to answer the door. Door open. Gentleman smiling, and he says, hello, how can I help you? And I said, look, I'm Rick Major. I go to the Raleigh Seventh Adventist Church. I'm coming, leaving church. I said, and I just wanted to stop and by and tell you the Holy Spirit is real. His power is real. Do you know what the man said? He started smiling and he said, I know, brother. He said, the Holy Spirit is real. He said, thank you for sharing that. And then I told him some other things. We were going to have 10 days of prayer and, and invite him and everything. Went to the next house. I said, wow. This was, that was a better batting average than back in the day when we used to do what was called in-gathering, where we'd go out and collect funds in the community each year. So I went to the next door. Ding dong, rang the doorbell. Lady answered the door, and it's like, it was almost like on television where they, 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 like somebody's coming to, to pick up the clothes or something like that. And she's smiling, and she, she looked at me, and she says, hi. And I said, no. You know, under normal circumstances, I would start backtracking. And Well, you know, it's COVID. Did you really mean to answer the door? And, and Hey, I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is real. 
And she said, I know, brother, I know. And I was, I was like, wow. She said, I go to such and such a church over in Garner, and we, we believe in the Holy Spirit. I said, all right, two for two. Went to the next house. No one answered the door. So I saw a car there, but the Holy Spirit didn't impress them. They answered the door. Went to the next house. Lady answered the door, and once again, smiling like she expected me to come. And I said, hi. I said, I'm Rick. And I went through the next four or five houses, same reception. I walked up the driveway, and one guy about, about Jeff's height, he was under the car. He was working under his truck, sorry. And so I'm walking up the driveway. I was like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to startle this man. He says, "Hey, I'm uh, I'm Rick." He says he rolled out. He had a little the little cart, and he he rolled out and he stood up. He was just towering over me. He said, I, "He said, yeah, how can I help you?" I said, "Hey, I still got the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't. It doesn't matter how tall you are or how big you are." I said, "I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit is real." I said, "I just had to share that with you." He said, "Look, brother, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that." Long story short, other than the house that I went to that no one answered the door, all the doors opened, and it was almost like, I don't want to break this record by, by, by going to the next. But it was so interesting to see the hope. And when I, look, when I finished, I was like, whoa, the Holy Spirit is real. Called my mother, and I said, Mom, I said, I Something happened today that was so wonderful. I've never, this has never happened to me before in my life. I said, it was almost like the people were expecting me. And she said, they were. And I said, whoa, what are you saying? She said, the Holy Spirit. He went before you. And I said, oh, this was, I mean... The chills, it, uh, the hair, it was a hair-raising experience, young man, because I was like, the Holy Spirit is real. So my point is, back in the 1960s when I was a young man, long before your parents were born, Kimberly, we weren't concerned with any of this foolishness that's going on now. We weren't, there's an election coming up in November. We weren't concerned about that. We were like, how many of those souls can we save? and have ready for the kingdom because Jesus Christ is coming soon. And the question for anyone that I run into now is, do you know what time it is? Brothers and sisters, Kimberly read the, the we're going to read the, uh, let the uh, text again. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the what? Come on now, feedback. The times and to know what? what Israel ought to do. So two things. David was trying to round, he was trying to consolidate his power. Saul had been killed in battle, and you all know the story. Saul had been killed, and the Philistines took David. Remember, David cut off Goliath's head and took it back to town to show uh, the, the Israelites that he had killed, he had slain the mightiest warrior in Philistine, the Philistines had. What the Philistines did, Saul was killed in the battlefield. They took his body, cut his head off, and then took his head back and mounted it in the temple before Dagon, their god. So they said, okay, you serve, you serve your god. We're going to put your king's head in front of our god as a symbol of our dominance and our ability to win this war. So David had been chased for a long time by Saul. It was time to consolidate the, the forces that were at his disposal. Obviously, Judah, Benjamin, and all that. But the, the northern uh, tribes, you know, like Issachar and, and Zebulun and Reuben and all of those, would they follow David? And so the, the 12th chapter of First Chronicles is beautiful because you have all of these tribes coming out, I think when you add it up, the, about 275,000 warriors came out. And in one group, they said, they said, these guys, they were so skilled, they could take slingshots with one, the left hand or the right hand and decimate people. And I saw a show one time, the guy had a slingshot, and he, 
I, th I think the, guy, the, the, the dummy was sitting back toward where Jeff is, and he took his slingshot, and it had, I think it had like a, a rock, like a rock size, like a ball bearing of some sort, and they had a, a mannequin, and he hit that thing in the head, and the head just exploded. And so David had practiced. David just didn't walk out there and take his sling, and Lord, I'm going to throw it, and did it hit Goliath? David expected he expected that stone to hit Goliath because he had practiced. That's the example, brothers and sisters, that we have in the church today. We need to understand the times, and we need to know what Israel ought to do so that when we come to church, we can encourage one another, we can exhort one another. So that was what, the, the, uh, in, in terms of leadership, even though Issachar had sent us, they sent a small group, those men, when they arrived, they became, immediately became the, the, the leaders of the bands and the hosts that were there because they knew the times and they knew what needed to be done, Israel needed to do. So when you think about it, it's just like Gideon. How many people did Gideon have that, that were with him? Was it 30,000 or 300? See? And so he didn't need 30,000 people. He needed people who were aware who when they drank their water, they had their heads up looking around. That's spiritual awareness, a great example. Uh, how many disciples did Jesus Christ have? He had 12 disciples. And yet they changed the whole world, brothers and sisters. Changed the whole world. So when we think about it, it doesn't take a lot. In fact, we need to understand that, uh, that I, I think when you think about it, God just needs, there was a movie called A Few Good Men. God just needs a few good women and men. I'll put the women first because the women are providing some great leadership in God's, in God's house, right? Amen? And so we need to understand that he can use all of us to do his bidding, brothers and sisters. Understanding the time. Who, who else understands the time? Let's read that text together. Be sober and be vigilant because... Your adversary, the devil, is as a what? A roaring lion. Is he a lion in a cage that they bring a little, uh, uh, some vitamins and a, and, a, and a steak to in the zoo? No, it says he's walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Doesn't matter who it is, he's coming for you. He understands, and this is the reason why. It says, woe for the earth, and in Revelation 12, woe unto the earth. And, uh, and the sea, because the devil has come down to you having great what? Anger. He's angry. He's angry. Why is, it, why is the devil angry? The answer is right there. It says, knowing that he has what? A short time. So he doesn't have a lot of time. He's angry because he knows that he has a short time. If he can run you over with a truck, if he can trip you up some way in your life through malfeasance, if it, the Bible talks about people who are angry, disobedient to parents, lovers of themselves, just so many things that the Bible talks about are representative of our time. So we should be looking at that. It, it, it doesn't help me to know what the president had for breakfast, and then I try to correlate that with some uh, text in the Bible or, or some, some religious leader. Jesus Christ, let me ask you, it, tell, me, tell me the text that you found in the Bible, if someone can tell me. Is there a place in the Bible where Christ ever, and look, the Romans were taking, they were taking people and dousing them in petroleum, some liquid, and using them to light the highway, burning people alive, brothers and sisters. Tell me one time that you saw Jesus say, you know what, I'm fed up with this. I'm going to go over and I'm going to talk to Herod. And then I'm going to get a chariot and we're going to go on over and talk to Caesar about this. What did Jesus say? He said, my kingdom what? It's not what? Of what? Of this world. He said, my kingdom is not of this world because he understood those are leaves on the tree. If I get people to stop doing certain things, but their heart is still a heart of stone, and it's not a heart of flesh, brothers and sisters. 
I haven't changed anything. I'll just, I, in, in, in my line of work, we have something, and many of you, called compliance. So there's all these specifications and all of these guidelines and everything, all of these requirements. And so I have to have a certain amount of participation by this group. I have to have a certain amount of participation by that group. I have to have a compliance. But guess what? When you think about it, Jesus Christ is not the least bit interested in compliance. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. What the type of person that he's looking for when it comes to someone who loves him and keeps his commandments. Christ understood the times. Jesus Christ, above all, he understood the times. Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. He came to restore. In fact, David said, Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew what? A right spirit within me. Because he didn't want to just be someone who did compliance. He wanted to be someone who loved Jesus Christ with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, his neighbor as himself. The burden of Christ's preaching was what? The time is what? Come on, give me some feedback. Time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, wait a minute. This is Jesus Christ. I thought Jesus Christ just came. He said, let all that other stuff go. Let all the prophecy and stuff. I don't need to. Uh, and I'll give you a good example. Uh, and we'll get back to this. A few years ago, I was, I was in church. And someone said, you know what? The prophecy thing, maybe we need to just kind of let that go and just tell people that Jesus loves them. He loves them. Died for two. All right, so Kevin, I had, I had black hair when, when that happened. I said, okay, I'll just, I'll, I'll just, you know, we'll just tell them that Jesus loves them. So, because these are new believers or could possibly new believers. So I didn't want to warn them. You don't want to warn them. You don't want to frighten them. Okay. A couple years later, is, is, it, is it safe to, to take them to higher ground now? Well, we still need to. Okay, so if you, so my hair started turning gray, and then years go, go by, and now the people are, are grow, the older, got grandkids, and I'm still like, you know, okay, so let's think about Christ's burden. What was his burden? Jesus, it says, the burden of Christ's pre preaching, this was what Christ did. The burden of his preaching was, A, the time is fulfilled. Jesus Christ knew the times, and he connected that with the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the what? The gospel. The gospel. Remember John the, Pap the Baptist, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He said, I shouldn't even baptize you. Jesus Christ said, no. He said, he said, you, you have to baptize me. I need to be baptized that all should be what? Fulfilled. So time, once again, Jesus Christ understood the time. Read Daniel not, chapter 9. It talks a lot about the coming Messiah and what he would do. And he would be cut off in the midst of the 69th week. 70, 70 weeks were determined. And so it was the people who were aware, who were keeping up with the time, that understood that Jesus Christ was the true Messiah. Thus the gospel message as given by the Savior himself was based upon what? Prophecies. Prophecies. Jesus Christ didn't just come and play in the fields and have a good time with the children and then wait for his time. He was telling people who he was. He let them know that the gospel message, Jesus Christ himself. He, look, he called himself the son of what? He was the son of man. He called himself the son of man. And when you read in Daniel, it, it, when, uh, when the vision by the Heidekel, when, when uh, Gabriel was standing there and, and he was supposed to make the, the, the vision plain to Daniel, and it says that a man's voice told him, hey, make that vision plain plain to Daniel. Make that vision plain to him. And of course, we know what that vision was. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ himself 
knew what time it was. Here's a prophecy chart. We won't go through that. But brothers and sisters, time is short. If, if we shared with people an understanding, we say, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't tell them about prophecy. That's the one thing we should tell people about so that they'll understand how, how short time is, brothers and sisters. 457 B.C., the decree went forth to rebuild Jerusalem from that time. The Bible said that 70 weeks or 490 years, Jesus Christ ministry, baptism, AD 27, okay? Three and a half years in the midst of the 70th week, Jesus Christ was crucified. Jesus Christ kept telling them, he, he says, I'm here, I'm fulfilling the prophecy. If people had been understanding and reading the prophecies, they would have understood who Christ was, A.D. 34, the stoning of Stephen, and then, of course, subsequent prophecy fulfillment. Here we go, 1844. Uh, my, my dad had a book, and I read it. was fascinating. Do you know how many, how many churches came into being in the, uh, around 1844? It, it's amazing. How, how, it's, not, it's almost improbable mathematically that many of these major churches that we see today came into being right around 1844 and yet our message was we knew what was happening October 22nd 1844 Jesus Christ moved from the holy place into the most holy place and beginning began his ministry in the most holy place the final phase of his ministry his ministry if you think about it in, in the terms of a three phase he, he, the, the Old Testament was kind of like the outer court. And then the, the, he went uh, to heaven. He was resurrected and he went to heaven, the ascension, and he began his ministry in the holy place. And then in 1844, he moved into the most holy place. And that should have told everybody on planet Earth. Revelation 14, 6, right? 14, 6 through 12, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the, what? The everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour, the hour, the time, it's time of his judgment is come. It's here. What we've been waiting for for so long, it's here. The hour of his judgment is come. That was a solemn event, brothers and sisters. Ellen White tells us that in the very designs and principles of the church of God, these truths are to enter. That means that whatever we're preaching as the gospel, it has to have a component that says the hour of his judgment has come. That, that's what gives the message urgency. That's what gives it the inspiration that we need in order to share with folks. Here's something else. When you're talking to your neighbors, if you want to talk about present truth and understanding the times, Revelation 11:19, 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the what? The ark of his what? His testament. What was the ark of the testament in the Old Testament? The ark of the testament was where the three components, the Ten Commandments, what was inside the ark? Ten Commandments, pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. Guess what? Revelation eleven nineteen tells you that in heaven, the Ark of His Testament is there, and you can see that cut out. What's, what's seated still in the Ark of, of the Testament? What's still there? The Ten Commandments. That means that no one can change the definition of the Sabbath to just one day in seven and no day in particular, or Sunday. I, and I love all my friends at work and all of that, but I tell them that text tells me that unless man uh, created a spaceship or something and flew to heaven and broke into the, the Ark of the Testament, like the, this is the, you know, the National Archives in, in, in Washington, D.C., where the Constitution is, and you've got to get through like a, a, an army and NATO peacekeepers and, and, and different people in order to get in there and steal the Constitution. No one can, can go to heaven 
and steal the ark and go in and take out those Ten Commandments because, as we know, God's law is a transcript of his character. He cannot change himself. As, we, as Dave mentioned earlier today, God is love. He loved us so much that he loves us more than himself. And he could do, excuse me, he could do no less because if he loved himself more than us, that would be called, it starts with an S, E, L, F, I, S, H. That would actually be selfish according to God's law because he said, love your neighbor as your what? Yourself. So God loves us with an infinite love that we, we, will, we will go through the ceaseless ages and still not understand why God loved us more than he loved himself. All right, so you know the times. Now it's time to know what to do. All right, there's all you need to see there. Power of the Holy Spirit, and what is he? Who is the author of the Holy Scriptures? Holy men of God moved as spake as they were moved by whom? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is actually the author, <laughs> authored the Bible. That's why Peter and others, when they would write text, they have to write out and then they'd say, wow, I've got to study that myself. And there's a good reason for that because he didn't give them something that no one else had so that they could say, wow, I'm really smart. Paul, it, what, what did Paul say after he wrote half the New Testament or most of it? And yet, what did he say? He said, that that I would, I don't do, right? You would think that someone with all of those writings, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and yet he said, I still need the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, I will, my carnal man will take over each day. Now, he did say in, in uh, Galatians 2.20, you know, he, he said that, he was a new being because of Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives where? In me. That's why Satan could not go back. That's why Satan couldn't be rehabilitated, couldn't be reconciled with God, because Satan said, I'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. And that's part of Henley's uh, poem, actually. But that it, it, it makes the case Satan would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. Why? Because throughout the ceaseless ages, brothers and sisters, God, uh, contrary to what you see in Marvel comics and all that kind of stuff and the superheroes and all that, God will not make demigods of us. We will still be reliant on the power of the Holy Spirit to keep our hearts beating throughout the ceaseless ages, brothers and sisters, Yes, you can eat from the tree of life. That's just symbolic. Because Jesus said, he said to the woman at the well, he said, I can give you water right now that will turn into a wellspring that is eternal life, everlasting life. I don't need to eat from the tree of life right now to have eternal life. Eternal life started when I accepted Christ. Amen? It started when I accepted Jesus Christ. So I have to know what to do. Think about this. The messengers of the cross must arm themselves with watchfulness and what? Prayer and move forward with what? We heard this earlier with faith and courage, working always in the name of Jesus. There will never be a time when you show up and say, hey, I'm here on behalf of Jeff Conkin. I'm here on behalf of the you're always there in the name of Jesus. Amen. They must exalt who? Christ as man's mediator in the heavenly sanctuary. This is, brothers and sisters, this is present truth. She's saying this is what God's messenger should be talking about right now. You have a mediator in heaven. Jesus is not sitting down on, uh, watching some big screen television in heaven saying, boy, that's terrible what happened to that lady. Wow, that's terrible. No. It says, working always in the name of Jesus, exalting Christ as man's mediator in the heavenly sanctuary, the one in whom all the sacrifices of the Old Testament dispensation centered. 
All of those sacrifices in the Old Testament, the showdown at Mount Carmel when they put 400 some cattle uh, or bullocks on that big barbecue pit and the fire came down from heaven and it says that it not only burned up the animals, but it burned up all of the stones and left dust. There was nothing left, brothers and sisters. Old Testament dispensation centered through whose atoning sacrifice the transgressors of God's law may find peace and pardon. Who doesn't want pardon, brothers and sisters? Who doesn't want? Mercy is receiving something, what? That you don't deserve, right? A pardon. And grace is receiving something, what? Uh, it's unmerited favor. It's unmerited favor, brothers and sisters. We're only saved by grace. We're only saved by grace, brothers and sisters. So, knowing what to do, Hebrews 2, 1 says, Therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed to things which we have heard, lest any time we should let them slip. When you look in, in uh, Strong's, that word slip, it, it, has, it, it, it gives you the feeling uh, uh, may pass by, may float by, almost like a ship just floating by. We're not, we're not people who are just floating, brothers and sisters. And Paul said, Paul said himself, if I come back, sister, and give you another gospel, don't believe it. Even if I come back and, we, look, uh, we're told in the spirit of prophecy, and I believe this, I believe this, because they're already talking about these, have you seen the story about these 10, these 10 story giants that they have now? That they can take a hologram of a person and then project it, and it's a three-dimensional a three-dimensional uh, effect of a person. I mean, 10 stories high, and it moves, and it, uh, it's amazing. Well, we're told that the signal powers of the heathen deities, they will, at some point, heathen deities will manifest their signal powers. At some point, and I believe it, I believe that at some point, Somewhere in Burma, or, or uh, I, I forgot the name, Myanmar, uh, over, over in places where they worship these heathen deities that have been sitting there for like 2,000 years. At some point, that thing is going to, we know it'll be an evil angel, but at some point, we're told that those heathen deities are going to wake up and they're going to move. Because that's going to be, this is such a wonderful time in which we're living, brothers and sisters, because Satan, as we were told earlier, Satan knows that his time is short. So he's going to take everything off the big screen, screen Black Panther and Thor and all that. You're going to see some stuff that is going to make people stop watching television because they're going to say, wow, did you hear about what happened over in such and such a place yesterday? And what does the Bible say? What did Christ say? He, he said, if they say he's in, the, the, of course, the Antichrist will eventually come, the Bible tells us. And it says, if he's, they say he's in the desert, are we supposed to go? If it, said, it says, if, if they say he's in the desert, should I pull on um, American News Network or CNN or Fox? or? or okay. No, it says don't go. Don't, don't even listen to it. Don't watch it. Why? You won't have to go. If you're a child of God, one of the final tests, we're told, will be that you'll be approached by people, uh, de uh, demons professing to be dead relatives. Uh, we're told in the great controversy, a, a book you can get at Walmart, that there's going to be Apostles, people, uh, uh, demons professing to be apostles, the Apostle Paul. You know what I said about the Sabbath? That we, we, we changed that. And so you're going to be the only person or one of the few people on earth that even with this person who's representing himself as Christ, even with these beings who are representing themselves as the disciples, even with the heathen deities, moving around, and oh, oh, by the way, all the political stuff, that'll be, that'll, there won't be any issues because 
everyone can agree on one thing, a day of rest. Whether you believe in global warming, even if you don't believe in that, you believe that we need a day of rest to honor God. And so both sides are going to say, whatever, for, for whatever reason you want to a day of rest, guess what? We can agree that it should be on this day. And that day is going to be Sunday, brothers and sisters. So that's, that's the preview. That's, brothers and sisters, that's the preview that God gave us to share with the world. That's the preview that he gave us. And, of course, we're afraid to take it to our neighbors and to our friends. Are we to wait? Listen, are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Remember I was telling you uh, earlier, uh, don't, 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 don't tell these folks. They might be new. It might be, you know, I grew up. Back in the day, we watched Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street, and all that. It doesn't frighten people. Newsflash. It doesn't frighten people to tell them what's happening in the world. Shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? And I always, I've, I've used the example, if this was a, a, a if, if I got over to this point, and this was, I was at the Grand Canyon, and there's a 2,000 foot drop or 1,500 foot drop from this point. I would hope that Sister Kimberly would she, Sister Kimberly wouldn't say, "Hey, Rick, um, be careful." I would hope that she would say, "Stop!" And as the Bible says, even grab me as a a brand plucked from a fire. Grab me. Say, "No, don't take another step." We're poor, we're miserable, we're blind, we're naked, but we think that we're rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. If I'm blind, I don't know that there's a, a 2,000 foot. I need someone to tell me, stop. And because we are where we are in Earth's history, brothers and sisters, at the time that we are in Earth's history, someone has to do it. Must we see things foretold come to pass before we will believe what he has said, in clear, distinct rays, light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is where? It's near at hand. Even at the doors, let us read and understand before it is what? It's too late. Here's, here's the problem. It's really too late. She wrote that a hundred some years ago. So how much closer are we to Christ's coming? Have we been watching the signs, the signs as Jesus Christ gave us? Here's a, here's a homework assignment. Go home and read Matthew 24 this afternoon. Read uh, the first chapter of Revelation, just the first three or four verses, and you'll be a new person. Finally, walking in the Spirit. All right, so you know that, have to know the times. And then you have to know what to do like the men of Issachar. And then you have to walk in the spirit. Romans 8, 1 says, there is now, uh, therefore, how much condemnation? No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the what? The spirit. You need the spirit for everything that you do, brothers and sisters. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There is liberty, brothers and sisters. Luke 12, 12 says, For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. That means that if someone calls me and they say, Hey, uh, sister, I want you to go come, come talk to, to the city council about your faith. Come talk to city council about, come, come to my church and tell them, I don't even have to worry. I've gone to church. I did Sabbath school lesson with Brother Kevin I participated, I read my Bible, and someone says, come, come share your faith. There's a promise right there. It says, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. So I don't even have to worry about being prepared, although the Bible says, be ye also ready. So the Holy Spirit will even teach, and I love that term, to te shall teach you in the, how much time do I have to be taught something when I have to say a word for the Lord 
and it's like instantaneous. Someone is asking me right now, why do you, why do you believe? It says the Holy Spirit will do that for me. Walking in the Spirit, here's something that we need to think about. So here's the definition. The Bible talks about giving meat in due season. So giving, give meat in due season to the old and what we talked about earlier, can, can, can people handle it? You know, Jack Nicholson said in that movie, you can't handle the truth. Can people handle the truth, brothers and sisters? Yes, they can. It says, give meat in due season to the old and the young, to saints, and to whom? To sinners. Let every, everything that can be said to awaken the church from its slumbers be brought forward without what? Delay. She wrote that almost 100 years ago, brothers and sisters. And then she says this. Read the first three verses of the Revelation and see what work is enjoined upon those who claim to believe the word of God. And I'm just going to, just for effect, I'm going to give you, instead of giving you the, the preview, I'm just going to give you, just so those of you who may not have read it recently, this is the book of Revelation. It says, the revelation of whom? Jesus Christ. Oh, did I cut that off yet? Okay, good. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear the record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all of the things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. You cannot disassociate, you cannot disconnect prophecy from the gospel, the gospel, the good news that's connected with prophecy. So walking in the spirit. Brothers and sisters, if you meet people and they claim to be walking in the spirit and they're not the happiest person that you met that day, something's wrong. John 13, 17 says, if you know these things, sober are ye. What does it say? Happy. Happy are ye if ye do them. Proverbs 10, 22, and I, I called a, a minister friend of mine, and I was telling him, I said, man, I said, I said look, uh, and this was right around, remember when they sent everybody home in 2020, and, and it looked like the economy was going to shut down, and, and everything was looking bleak, and, and, I, and I, I, I was telling uh, this minister friend of mine, I said, I, 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 I was like, whoa, I said, it, they, they're saying this, watching the news, okay? They're, they're saying that the economy's gonna collapse and this is gonna happen and, that, and, and woe is me. And so I got to the point where every time you turn the news on, it didn't matter which channel, it's either breaking news or new news or, or hot news or, you know, but it's like when you hear that, it's like your heart starts, oh, what are they getting ready to tell me? And he said, read Proverbs 10, 22, brother. So I opened up the Bible. It says, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. And he added what? How much sorrow to it? No sorrow to it. So our message is joyful. Our message is uh, just something that should bring smiles to people's faces. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich physically or spiritually. It, does it make, it, do, do I ask the Lord's blessing so I can buy a new house or a, a new car? Or do I need those blessings that can bring me into his favor? And it says he addeth no sorrow to it. He will never add sorrow. Now, we might go through problems and the crucible that we've been talking about. But think about this. It says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, work it for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Whatever you're going through, brothers and sisters, whatever challenges you have in your life, it says it's just a, what kind of affliction? A light affliction. Because we're told when we get to heaven and we look around, and, but most importantly, when we see Jesus, 
we're going to say heaven is cheap enough. And my thing is like David, I want to get to the point where I know Jesus Christ so well that when he arrives, he's living in my heart. When he arrives, I'll just say, good to see you, Jesus, because I already know him. He's already in my heart. He's living and shining forth through me, brothers and sisters. So whatever you're going through is just a light affliction. Nehemiah 8.10, this is my, my mother's text. You know, whenever I call her, you know, moms just give it to you straight. And whenever I call her and I say, oh, mom, I'm going through this. Or I'm dealing with this at work. Or I've got this. She said, think about Nehemiah. Go your way. Eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither, by the way, which, which day of the week is holy unto the Lord, brothers and sisters? Just all right. So you're you're on. This is the day that's holy to, to him. It says, neither be ye sorry. It says for the joy of the Lord is what your strength. That's what it is. That Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. But as the spirit is working in and through you, it says the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's why Paul and Silas were able to sit in the stocks in a prison inside, they actually, they were in a prison that had, they were in a prison and then there was like an out, outer perimeter so that no one could break in and get them. So it was like a prison inside of a prison. They were in maximum security. And then they still had them locked up with chains and their foot, their feet in the stocks. And yet they were doing what? They were singing. Brothers and sisters, now I can't sing, but I love that song. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know that he watches me. Amen? That's the kind of spirit that we need to have. That's the kind of spirit that the Holy Spirit can give you. Micah 7, 18. Who, Micah said, who is a God like unto thee? It says, that parteth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his what? His anger forever because he delighteth in what? Mercy. That means Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit. We've been sold a bill of goods by Satan because when you, I saw a guy on TV and he said, he was, he was like, oh, and these Christians, they serve this God that, that wants to throw a lightning bolt at you and, and, and murder you and kill you anytime you do wrong. And yet this just told me, Michael said, who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth trans in iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. God is looking for people to forgive. God is looking for people to pardon. He's looking for people to reconcile with. He doesn't want any to perish, he, but that all should come to what? A knowledge of the truth. Brothers and sisters, that is what God is looking for. So in closing, we've talked about how to understand the times and how to know what to do when you understand the times and knowing what to do. It's high time. It's Romans, in the book of Romans, it tells us it's high time because our salvation is nearer than it has ever been. Whatever, whenever you came to Christ, salvation is nearer than, than even then, brothers and sisters. And then finally, walking in the spirit, understanding what it means to move. It, it, it says in, in him we live and move and have our what? Our being our being. So I'll know what to ask for. I'll know God will, like Brother Kevin was saying, I'll know what to ask for and I'll know when to ask for it. And he can't help but, he said, if you ask anything in my name, my father, we just saw. He, he, he would rather give us mercy, he'd rather give us pardon than to give us a good gift. So those are the things, brothers and sisters, that we need to, to think about, that we need to be prepared to share with our neighbors, with our friends. And think about this, this final text, and I didn't put it on the board, but this is, a, this is a, an important text. 
Romans 10, 14, and it says this. Think about your, think, think about your, your neighbors and your friends, young man. Think about your, your friends, young man. It says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? This is my neighbor. This is my neighbor that I wave to every day. And, well, they, they probably wouldn't want to hear about my church. I'll go, I'll go over to India and teach and preach and, and be a missionary. But in my neighborhood? But how will my neighbor know? And then it says, and how shall they hear, Sister Kimberly, without a preacher? How, how will they hear without a preacher? That's, the sad, that's a sad tale. That's a sad indictment of us as Christians. We don't want to brighten the corner where we are. We'd rather go over to some faraway land. And that way my neighbor, because if you think about it, if you came to work with me and you said, wow, Rick came and he preached or he taught Sabbath school or he's a deacon or he, whatever it is that I do in the church and the person says, are we talking about the same Rick? <laughs> are we talking about the guy that cusses people out and screams and yells and can't get along with anyone, but is always trying to get people to come to church with him? That Rick? That Rick? Is that the Rick we're talking about? So brothers and sisters, that's the beauty of being a child of God. You have an opportunity to be his ambassador you have an opportunity to, to leave church and go wherever you choose to go, wherever the Holy Spirit tells you to go, and you can go with confidence knowing that he already went before you and paved the way, and he wants everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth. Brothers and sisters, as we close, I'll just, I'll just ask you, how many of you want to know what time it is? How many of you want to know what to do, and then to walk in the Spirit. Are you interested? Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Amen. Because we know that time is short, and the Lord is coming. Jesus Christ is coming soon, and he wants everyone in this room and within the hearing of my voice to be saved. God bless you.